Welcome to Center Seat. Let's bring in our panel tonight. Syndicated columnist George Will, Mara Elias, and national political correspondent of National Public Radio. Syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. And in the center seat tonight, we welcome Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul. Senator, thanks for being here. Glad to be with you. A lot of people asking, what do you think happens with Obamacare and where this all ends up? The end game here as we see all of the pieces of this moving forward. You know, I don't think it's fixable. And I think that most of the fixes coming from the executive are unconstitutional. Uh, one of the clear separations of powers was that the legislature was supposed to legislate and the president wasn't. He's essentially amended Obamacare maybe 20 some odd times and I don't think he's allowed to. And so I think it needs to be decided in court. But I think his fix saying, oh, you can still sell these insurance policies. Well, they've quit selling these insurance policies. They're not going to all of a sudden call you up and say, oh, yeah, we can give you the cheaper policy when they know President Obama is actually forcing them into the more expensive policy within a year. But do you think that the administration, the president, will somehow back down, realizing that the thing's not coming together? Or do you think that it's going to take an effort some other way? Well, you know, I, I had predicted two weeks ago that within a month he would do something. Within two weeks he did something because it was so horrendous. You know, they were repeating over and over again that he had promised you you could keep your doctor, and apparently it isn't true. The other thing that hasn't been reported enough is that we actually had a vote in the Senate. This isn't part of the original Obamacare. It's a regulation passed three months later, and we voted to try to get rid of the rule to say you couldn't be canceled. Every Republican said we didn't like the rule and voted against it. Every Democrat, including some of those now running away from this rule, voted to keep this rule, specifically the rule allowing them to cancel your policy. Mark. Senator, what would you like to replace Obamacare with, or do you think that the system we had before the law was passed was just fine? You know, I practiced medicine for 20 years, and I think the system we had wasn't real capitalism, didn't have great competition, and didn't work well. So really, if you want a good system, you need a system that has good competition. For example, I do cataract surgery. My charge was the same as every doctor in the whole country for cataract surgery because Medicare paid for most of it. If you were to double magically the number of ophthalmologists in one night, we'd spend twice as much and the price would be the same because prices don't go up and down. That's a true marketplace. But I think we went the wrong way. He narrowed the marketplace. The only marketplace in medicine were health savings accounts and he made them smaller. I would make them almost infinite and let them use, you use them for your college education if you didn't use them for your medicine and for your medical care. So tax-free savings to pay for your medical care, and that would be the Republican plan. Well, it helps. And what it does is when you have tax-free accounts, you buy policies with higher deductibles, and they're cheaper. Under Obamacare, you have higher deductibles, and they're not cheaper because they mandate that it covers 15 different items that you have to have. So a 24-year-old single guy has to have dental coverage for his kids that he doesn't have and pregnancy coverage for the wife he doesn't have. And so under our system, you'd have higher deductibles but lower premiums, but you'd have more freedom as to how to spend your money. Charles. Well, um, Senator, when Obamacare was an issue uh, a month ago, when it came to continuing resolution to funding the government, you supported the, you fi the filibuster of other senators uh, who demanded that you had to have a change or abolition of Obamacare as a condition for funding the government. In retrospect, you think that was a good strategy, but even more important, looking ahead, the deadlines are coming up, the resolution is going to run out, we're going to hit the dead ceiling soon. Would you be prepared to, to use the same tactic uh, as we approach the new deadlines? Well, I said throughout the whole battle that shutting down the government was a dumb idea. Even though it did appear as if I was participating in it, I said it was a dumb idea. And the reason I voted for it, though, is that it's a conundrum. Here's the conundrum. We have a $17 trillion debt. And people at home tell me, we can't give the president a blank check. We just can't keep raising the debt ceiling without conditions. So unconditionally raising the debt ceiling, nobody at home wants me to vote for that, and I can't vote for that. But the conundrum is, if I don't, we do approach these deadlines. So there is an impasse. In 2011, though, we had this impasse, and the president did negotiate. We got the sequester. If we were to extend the sequester from discretionary spending to all the entitlements, we would actually fix our problem within a few years. But what if the, the Democrats and the president resist any of that as we approach the expiration of the continuing resolution? I think they will resist, and I think they know that our leverage is diminished and our will to shut down the Which government is diminished. Well, I will, I will not vote to raise the debt ceiling without conditions, but that doesn't mean I'm in favor of, you know, sometimes you vote no and the government still stays open. So I'm in favor of voting for the principled position, but trying not to be the fly in the ointment that shuts the government you down. You mean as long as your side doesn't have a majority? 
Well, that's the difficulty because we have the majority in the House and we're a minority in the Senate. So uh, that is the difficulty. When they when we got out of the impasse last time, it took mostly Democrats and some Republicans. If it's a tie, I predict that's what it will take if it's again. It's a tie and you're the deciding vote. Which <laughs> um, if it's a tie in the deciding vote, I have to vote for what everybody in Kentucky wants, and that's that we cannot raise the debt ceiling unconditionally. George, you you begin this evening by saying. What the president is doing when he revises the language of the law, and this is the president without a line item veto even to change numbers, is unconstitutional. However, if he gets away with it and it becomes established practice, then it becomes constitutional by default. And you, the Supreme Court will not intervene to referee this dispute between the branches. What can be done? Well, I think, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that because I keep asking lawyers and I ask friends in the Senate who are constitutional lawyers, how do we get standing to adjudicate this question? Most of them say it's very difficult, if not impossible. And so I don't know how you answer this. But to me, it's one of the fundamental tenets of our country is the separation of powers. That legislature, in fact, Montesquieu said that if you allow the executive to legislate, you're essentially allowing him to become tyrannical. So we have to do something about it. I think there should be an avenue through the Supreme Court, but so far I haven't uh, discovered how we would do it. The president has now defined success down. That is, a 20 percent failure rate is considered a success. But if that fix produces that result, 80 percent in, 20 percent out, the adverse selection it gets worse. That is, premiums will go up in the next year. Right. Can you see any way of avoiding either higher subsidies at that point to make the premiums affordable or price controls? And can you see either of those getting through Congress? No, and that's why I wonder whether he does that unilaterally, too. And if we keep getting unilaterally closer and closer to a single-payer system, but you've hit the nail on the head. Young people aren't buying this now. We're trying to force them by penalizing them, but even the penalty's not enough. But if young people don't buy it, the price in a year, it's going to be even higher for the young, healthy people, and it will essentially be a high-risk pool, which is very expensive to cover, and then the prices go higher and higher and higher, and the only fix become more mandates. But that's why it's important. Some people have said the discussion over Obamacare isn't about health care. It's about freedom of choice versus coercion. The president is coercing you into four plans, and he's telling you exactly what you have to buy. This is extraordinary in our country, and that's why the whole Supreme Court case was, was something that was incredibly important, and I'm still incredibly disappointed at the outcome. Senator, uh, we asked some people to, to tweet in questions to you, one of them uh, from Mock Tink writes this, uh, do you think that the two sides can get a budget done or are we doomed to a continuing resolution for the rest of President Obama's term in office? Doomed. Period. Well, the, the reason is, is that, for example, the budget in the House doesn't raise taxes. The Republican budget doesn't raise taxes. The Senate budget raises taxes a trillion dollars. Splitting the middle of this isn't acceptable, you know, to us because we think raising taxes again is bad for the economy. So I don't think we're going to vote for a $500 billion tax increase. In fact, I don't think Republicans are going to vote for a tax increase. So continuing resolutions go on. But here's where some of the blame lies. If you did individual appropriation bills, you wouldn't have a continuing resolution. Harry Reid could pass individual appropriations bills, but he hasn't done it. There are 12 different appropriations bills. If you did that, there'd be no enormous uh, continuing resolution. So this current budget conference committee back and forth and hearing that it's possible, you just don't buy it? I'm, say, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be negotiation. We shouldn't try. But if I had to predict January 15th, there'll be another continuing resolution. It's a really bad way to run your government. 2,000-page bill will come out. Nobody has time to read it, and it'll be plopped on the desk. The last one, we had one bill, and all senators were allowed to read one bill. So all of our staff were in there looking over his shoulders trying to read a 2,000-page bill, and that's why stuff gets stuck in in the dead of night that goes, how did that get in there? Oh, surprise, surprise. That was in the bill. I didn't know that. Senator, stand by if you would. Welcome back to Senator Seat. Our guest, Senator Rand Paul. Uh, Senator, another Twitter question for you quickly. Richard Garner writes this. Uh, what would he suggest we do about Iran versus our current policy? Would he allow them to have a nuke? Uh, no, and you know I voted repeatedly for sanctions, and uh, I would like to bring them to the negotiating table. And it appears as if the sanctions are working. So would you do anything? To the negotiating table. Would you do anything different than this administration is doing? You know, I guess it's unclear what we're doing at this point because I'm not privy to exactly what is going on with the negotiations. But I think it's a good sign that we are in negotiations, and that Iran, I think, is feeling 
the sanctions, and I think that's why they've come to the negotiating But table. this administration, it seems, is trying to dial back on the sanctions in order to go to this next step. Are you in favor of that? I think that if you go to negotiations, there will be carrot and stick, and I'm not sure what the, I know what the stick is, but I'm not sure what the carrot is and what the exchange will be. But I think if you want to negotiate and you want to have diplomacy, there is some kind of exchange. I do think, though, that ultimately if we want Iran to behave and enter into the civilized world again, I think China and Russia can have a great deal of influence on this. Most of the oil that flows through the Straits of Hormuz goes out to the West, India, Japan, China. And while we've limited, they still are importing quite a bit of that oil. Ultimately, if China were completely with us on this, I think Iran would turn around and really would accept uh, significant, significant but, changes. But, Senator, China has shown zero interest in reigning in Iran's nuclear program over the last decade, and Russia as well. There's no hope of that happening. Our only hope is, as you said, the sanctions. There's now a move in Congress to increase the sanctions precisely because the current sanctions are the one thing that brought the regime into negotiations. Do you support or do you oppose the move in Congress right now to increase the sanctions? I haven't seen what the sanctions are yet, but what I would say is that I am a little bit concerned about having new sanctions in the middle of negotiations, whether that leads to more negotiation or less negotiation. And I think there's at least a reasonable argument that adding new sanctions, and I've supported every one of the sanctions so far, but adding new sanctions in the middle of the negotiation, whether that's a good idea or not, or whether that scares them away from the table, um, my goal is this. I want the outcome to hopefully be one that's not war. I think we've had quite a bit of war in the last decade. I would like to have an outcome where Iran agrees not to uh, create nuclear weapons, but at the same time we do it without having to have a if war. I, let me ask one last question, therefore. If the negotiations collapse, if the Iranians either walk away or they violate, or it simply doesn't proceed, are you prepared as a last resort with Iran about to go nuclear, would you be prepared, to, if you were the president, to order a military strike as a way to prevent that outcome? I would say all options would be on the table, and that would include military. I would also be prepared to vote for more sanctions if we go away from negotiations and the negotiations fail. I think in the midst of negotiations, it's a mistake, though. George. Let me ask Charles' question in just a different way. The president has been very specific, saying, my policy is not containment of a nuclear Iran. Would President Paul have the same policy, that you, do, you, you would act to make it impossible for them to have nuclear weapons? Right. What I've said with regard to containment is, is that we, it shouldn't be our policy at this point in time in trying to prevent them from having nuclear weapons. The one reason I haven't liked to use the word never with regards to containment is that if you said that with regard to China or Pakistan, or North Korea, we would now be at war with those countries because all of a sudden one day they had nuclear weapons. So I don't think it should be our policy to say, oh, you can have nuclear weapons and we'll contain you. That shouldn't be our policy. But I don't think we should also say the extension of that, that we will never have containment as a policy. Containment actually for 70 years was a great policy with regard to the Soviet Union. Well, suppose the Israelis came to you and said the progress is too fast. They're too close now. We must strike. Will you help us? What would um, you say? You know, I think that's a tough situation. I think with, with regard to Israel uh, deciding it's in their best interest, I don't think it's ever uh, our obligation to criticize them for defending their country. So if they decided to act unilaterally, I don't think it's our place to be criticized. What if they said we can't well, do that's, it. A, that's another yeah. question, and I think it has to be probably decided by what the facts on the ground are at that point and how close they are. So really, Decisions like that, I think, are sometimes dependent on facts you may not have, you know, even within the Senate or amongst us, we may not have the facts. Mara, 2016 question. 2016. As command, you would have the facts if you were commander in chief. Right. So let me ask you a question about that. Voters are completely disgusted with Washington. Every player here gets abysmally, historically low ratings from the president to the leadership in Congress. Why wouldn't voters want an outsider in 2016? A Republican governor, maybe a conservative governor of a blue state. I think they, no names here. <laughs> I think they want someone outside of, uh, you know, what's been going on. So, for example, someone like myself who's been promoting term limits, someone who says we shouldn't have, you know, decade after decade longevity up here. And I think I'm enough new here to still be perceived as an outsider, should that be the choice at some time in 2016. 
But um, I don't know that a governor is necessarily an outsider. A governor can be an insider as much as anybody else. I think you want somebody who maybe hasn't spent their whole life in politics. People have had another career. And when young people come up to me that, and ask about getting involved in politics, that's my number one advice. Go get a real job. You know, do something. Have a real career before you get involved like in politics. Like being an eye doctor, for example. Is, yeah. is Chris Christie a conservative? <clears throat> You know, it depends on how you define that. If you have a very loose definition, probably. Um, if you look at a lot of issues, like on whether or not we should accept Obamacare, bring it to our state, expand Medicaid, those would be, I think, at best moderate positions. Um, so, but everybody has to make that judge. You know, but I think we have room for moderates in our in our party. All right, Senator, thank you very much for being here on Senator's seat. I really appreciate it.